Well, it's just that kind of day. It's raining here in Canada, in the Torch Center North, but it could be a lot worse. I heard from my friends back home in Houston that it's absolutely sweltering 102. My heart goes out to them. But regardless, there's something that we can all agree upon. If you have inclement or suffocatingly hot weather, all that can be ameliorated with a nice Parsha podcast. I know some of y'all like to listen with your coffee, with your iced coffee. Maybe you crack open a Coke Zero, a whiskey and a cigar. A lot of people tell me that they like to listen to the Parsha podcast as they are preparing for Shabbos. How do you like to enjoy the Parsha podcast? Send me an email, rabbiwolbejima.com. But now, let us begin with Parshas Pinchas. Parshas Pinchas is the second longest Parsha in the Torah, and it starts with the aftermath of the events of the end of last week's Parsha. Pinchas is the hero of the day. He is lauded for his zealotry for stopping the plague, and he is promoted into becoming a Kohen. The guilty parties are named. Zimri is the male. Kuzbi is the female. And then we have the commandment to wage war with the Midianites because of what they did, because of what they tried to do to our people. We must take revenge, though the implementation of this war, the war against Midian, doesn't happen until later on in the Torah. Afterwards, the Jewish people are counted once again. They were counted at the beginning of the book of Numbers. Now they are counted a second time. Rashi tells us that this is either to determine how many people are left following the plague. Alternatively, Moshe is about to hand in the keys to God to retire as leader of the people. And therefore, he wants to give an accounting, a reckoning of what he is returning to the Almighty. And the count is interesting because absent Joshua and Caleb, there's no overlap between this count and the one at the beginning of the book. There has been a total turnover of the generation. Everyone from the previous generation has passed, and now there's a new generation, their children. They are the ones who are going to enter the land. And these are the people to whom the land will be apportioned and allocated. Then we have the interesting episode of the daughters of Tzlafchad. Tzlafchad from the tribe of Menashe has five daughters and no sons. And the daughters launch a claim that they should be the rightful heirs of their father's inheritance. Moshe consults with God and their claim is granted. Then Moshe asks God to appoint a successor for him, given that he is barred from leading the nation across the Jordan, and God tells him to crown Joshua, his disciple, as his successor, place your hands upon him, and coronate him as your heir. And the parsha ends with the delineation of the festivals and specifically highlighting the various sacrifices that are brought on each of the festivals. In this podcast, I want to focus on the eponymous character hero of our Parsha, Pinchas. Pinchas did something very valuable for the Jewish people. Thanks to the behavior of the Jews with the daughters of Moab, to the behavior of Zimri and Kazbi, there was a plague that was unleashed. And the Ramban, in the beginning of our Parsha, tells us that if not for Pinchas, everyone would have died. There was a plague that was targeting the entirety of the nation, and thanks to Pinchas' heroism, endangering himself to stamp out this rotten apple, the nation was spared. And thanks to that, Pinchas is promoted, and he is made into a Kohen. 
even though he was a grandson of Aaron, the son of Elazar, the son of Aaron. And therefore you would think that he's part of this special Kohanic priestly family amongst the Jewish people. He should be a Kohen. But the rule was that only Aaron and his four sons were anointed as Kohanim. And all sons born to them subsequently would be incorporated into the special family would be Kohanim. But because Pinchas was alive, was extant at the time of the coronation of his father and his uncles and his grandfather, Aaron, he was not included. He was an ordinary Levite. But now that changes. Pinchas is being promoted. He is going to be a Kohen. And not just any Kohen. He's going to be the high priest. And in fact, he's going to be the antecedent of legions of high priests. The Talmud tells us 80 high priests in the first temple were descendants of Pinchas and 300 high priests in the second temple, all of them were descendants of Pinchas. Now, Pinchas is also known by another name. Our Satanists tell us that Elijah the prophet is none other than Pinchas. And in fact, they exhibit similar tendencies. Like his alter ego Pinchas, Elijah was relentless in his efforts to save the Jewish people. He was fearless, just as Pinchas risked death in his act of valor and heroism, so too Elijah was willing to face up tyrannical, totalitarian autocrats to try to get them to repent and to try to shepherd the nation back to the right path. So Pinchas indeed is a great hero, and our parish is named after him, and he's looked up for all eternity for what he did, risking his life to save the nation, risking his life to stamp out this force of evil. He's a Kohen. He is going to be promoted to be a Kohen. And a Kohen Gadol, Pinchas, is a great hero for our people. I want to ask an interesting question. And this question hopefully will help transition us to the idea that I want to convey to you today. Pinchas was Aaron's grandson. Pinchas, the son of Elazar, who was the son of Aaron. Yet Pinchas was not a Kohen. Again, Rashi tells us that when Aaron was anointed, it was him and his four sons. And because Pinchas was alive, he was not included until now when he, many years later, 38 years later, is going to be elevated finally to be the level of Levite where he's a Kohen, like his father, like his grandfather. So for nearly 40 years, all of Pinchas' relatives, they're part of this rarefied cohort of Levites, they're Kohanim, and Pinchas is just an ordinary Levite. And he's watching his brothers and his cousins and his uncles and his grandfather doing all the work in the tabernacle, the special family, these are the Kohanim, and he's not allowed. He is a Levite, of course, Levites have important roles to play as leaders amongst the people, but he's not a Kohen. Now, ultimately, Pinchas was made into being a Kohen. And of course, God knew that ahead of time. See, here's the question. Why not make Pinchas a Kohen to begin with? When the appointment, when the anointing of the Kohanim happened, there was this rule, but it seems like it's kind of an arbitrary rule. Only Aaron and his sons were anointed, but the grandsons who were alive were not anointed. Only grandsons born subsequently are to be included. And therefore Pinchas, who was already born when this anointment of the high priest Aaron and his sons happened, even though in the future he became a Kohen, at that juncture he was just destined to remain a Levite. And the question is why? The rule that just Aaron and his sons are made into Kohanim could have just as easily been Aaron and his living descendants, sons and grandsons alike. Why did Pinchas 
have to go through 38 years of watching his father and his uncle and his cousins all serve as Kohanim. And only later on, after 38 years of being a Levite, only later on to be added into that group due to his heroism. Why was Pinchas forced to be on the sidelines for 38 years as a non kohen ordinary Levite, only to be later admitted into this fraternity? Make him into a kohen right away, and you'd have his services for 38 years. Why deny him priesthood initially? So I want to suggest an answer with what I think is a major insight. One of those really powerful ideas, really potent, that I can only share with you, the Parsha podcast, Faithful. I like to call this idea strategic demotion. Pinchas, of course, could have been anointed as a Kohen at the very beginning. He was qualified, grandson of Aaron. He was destined in the future to become one anyhow. But God deliberately withheld it from him to put a chip on his shoulder, to give him a grievance, to give him something to prove Because that demotion, that strategic demotion, would bring the most and the best out of Pinchas. For some people, when they are not given praise, when promotions are withheld from them, when they're overlooked, when they're underappreciated, that could be very valuable to a person. Because it could spur the person to try to prove themselves to the world. And thus, ironically, being overlooked can end up being the best thing for a person because it helps them maximize their greatness. There's a big idea over here. We are not in this world for very long. I know they're working on all these longevity projects. But regardless, we're here for a fixed amount of time. And whether it's 70 years or 150 years, it's still relatively a small little sliver in time. And of course, we know that our permanent self is not in this world. Our permanent life is when we depart from this world. But we're here for a fixed amount of time. We don't know when that's going to end. And we have a mission. We're here to work, to achieve, to build, to develop, to make the most of our opportunities while we're here. While we're here, while we have the body and the soul and the eight Sahara and the complete mess that makes up man, all these paradoxes, all these contradictions, and we're being pulled in every direction. This is the time to build. This is the time to work. And all of us have immense potential. But to actualize it is maddeningly difficult. But that's our life's mission. And we can't just settle. And like a good CPA, that's going to squeeze out every dime of tax savings. And you say, who cares? You already made so much. Give a little bit more to Uncle Sam. What's the big deal? But no. A good accountant turns over every stone to find every legal loophole for you to maximize what you're going to take away this year. That's how we have to be with our soul, and with our potential in this world. We don't want to leave anything, not a dime, not a spiritual dime, on the table. We want to get everything out of life over here. That's what we're here to do. And I think in the story of Pinchas, we see an exotic method 
for how to motivate someone to achieve really big things. By denying them what they, at least on the surface, they appear to deserve, or planting an urge within them to prove the whole world wrong. And they become motivated to show the world, look what I can become. And that motivation, that fire in their belly, positions them to actualize their potential. And the theory goes that had Pinchas been anointed together with his uncles and cousins and grandfather as a Kohen from the beginning, he would not have that chip on his shoulder, he would not have had that fire within him to channel towards this zealotry, and he would not have achieved his greatness. The way to motivate Pinchas, the way to ensure or to at least best position him to achieve his destiny, to become this generational high priest, to become Elijah, it's by initially denying him what perhaps he thought he was deserving of. And those 38 years of not being a Kohen, of being demoted, planted this fire within him that was allowed expression when the time came and he was ready. And thus, this strategic demotion, or at least this lack of promotion, was the best thing for him because it kept him hungry and it put him in position to truly unlock his full potential. Now, I think this could be a little bit dangerous. It's a very sophisticated tool, and I don't think it is for everyone. If it is to be used, it must be used very carefully and very selectively. I think for the wrong person, for the wrong circumstances, it could backfire. If someone is unfairly overlooked, perhaps it could plunge them into depression, into a quagmire that they just are not able to climb out of. And potentially, misusing this tool could result in a person not only not improving themselves and not improving their chances to achieve their full potential, but it could actually have a negative effect on them. They collapse into depression, into melancholy. But there is a certain character profile akin to Pinchas. There is a situation, there is a circumstance in which strategic demotion makes them so hungry to prove themselves that it unearths greatness that never would have surfaced otherwise. And I think even if we do deploy this tool very selectively and very carefully and very responsibly, as observers, we see this in action all the time. You know, just a week ago, I was in Israel. I had the great fortune of spending around 10 days in Israel with my two oldest boys and I went with no microphones, and I recorded no podcasts, and I'm still trying to climb out of the inbox hole that neglecting my emails for more than a week resulted in. And when we were in Israel, we did a mix of things. We did some holy things to get a feeling of the history of the land and the, the holy places in the land. You know, went, of course, to the Western Wall to the Kotel and to Meiron and Svat and we visited with some great rabbis and we studied in some of the great yeshivos. But we also did some fun stuff, you know, kayaking down the Jordan River and hiking and eating out a lot. Of course, you know, when you're on vacation, you don't really make food at home. At one point, the kids had a 10-day pizza streak for 10 days. They had pizza every single day, at least for one of the meals. And they were really upset at me because I said, okay, today, no more pizza. You can have falafel, you can have shawarma, you can get a burger, but no pizza. And they were very upset. They picked up their street the following day. And I think they kept the street the rest of their time. But they had a good time, shall we say. But I feel like for me, you know, I spent many years in Israel 
but coming back and visiting it and contrasting it with what life is like over here, I feel like I really got a pulse of the land. And it's undeniable that there's just an intensity, there's an energy that exists over there. It's just, it's just not matched in this country. And my theory goes that in Israel, because they are perpetually living with this tension, with this existential tension, and they're always on a knife's edge, and there's always a crisis, everything is moving with such dynamism, such intensity. You know, I was thinking, we rented a car there. And in Canada, now we're in Canada. When I drive in Canada, I'm, I'm just the king of the road. You know, I'm an American coming here, and all these polite Canadians, they're just no match. They're no match to me. But in Israel, I'm like a little sheep. It's a full contact sport. You got to fight for your rights. If you're not going to fight for it, nothing will be given to you. And there's always people walking down the streets with a head of steam, with a purpose. Israel has a certain dynamism that's just not matched by what we have over here. And you know, there's this old saying, hard times create strong men. And strong men create good times. And good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. Now, I don't know if it's so neat, but there is some truth to this. When you are living a very difficult life, nothing's just given to you for free. It does motivate you to develop yourself and to unlock more of what is within your potential. You see these immigrants... And they're hungry. They don't have the benefits of incumbency. It's not easy for them, but they work really hard. And you get that feeling in Israel that all the hard times created a hunger and an ambition that just permeates the whole country. And I feel like sometimes over here, there's this feeling, well, things are good. We can coast we can compound, you know, the hard work of previous generations. We could spend our time, you know, doing nonsense, watching TikTok, chilling out. But there is something that like a wartime environment unlocks. There is human potential that is brought about through denial. There are enormous advances that are just not possible during peacetime. There are circumstances that are better designed to help humanity maximize output. And I think that it's really important if we're going to live our life here properly, it's important for us to always be hungry, to always have ambition, and to not get fat and decadent and when you have everything, and where things are just handed to you on a silver platter, and everything's taken care of, there's just less hunger. Pinchas had to work really hard to get there, but that's why he became a legend, because so much was denied to him. You see sometimes, you know, wunderkinds that don't always live up to their potential. People with enormous ability and things really go smoothly, swimmingly for them and they kind of coast and they don't really work really hard. They don't live up to what they can become. But when you're underappreciated initially, it could really help bring forth all your true potential. And that's why we don't crown wunderkinds. I was studying last week a piece of Torah in the book of Genesis with my dear friend Alan. And we encountered this really interesting piece in the Talmud. It's talking about Noah. Remember Noah? All the way back from the beginning of the book of Genesis, Noah is really righteous. The Torah describes him as a tzaddik tamim, a perfect tzaddik. He's a perfect tzaddik. This is a tzaddik, righteous person. And then there is Noah, who's just completely, pristinely righteous. 
And when God summons Noah to the ark, he tells him, come to the ark. Because I view you as a tzaddik. I view you as being righteous before me in this generation. So Thomas says, wait a minute. When the Torah describes Noah, it calls him a tzaddik tamim, a perfect tzaddik. Yet when God summons Noah, he's just a vanilla, generic tzaddik. Why, when he's described by the Torah, is he a tzaddik tamim, a completely perfect, righteous person? Yet when God speaks to him, he calls him only a tzaddik, not a tzaddik tamim, just a righteous person, but not a perfectly righteous person. Says the Talmud, this tells us that when you give praise to a person, when they're not around and you're talking about them, then you give them the full praise. When Noah's not around and the Torah is described to Noah, he's perfectly righteous. But when you speak to them, when they're around, when they're there to hear your praise about them, you give them only partial praise. Really interesting policy that the Talmud tells us in the book of Erevin, page 18b. When you're in front of someone, you only say partial praise. You give them complete praise when they're not around. Now, as an aside, I did see that the Ben Yehoyada says that this policy enables us to pray. Because we're always in the presence of God and we can never say God's full praise. And therefore, the only way that we can open up our mouths and try to praise God in prayer, it's only because when you're in the presence of someone, you're allowed, in fact, you're encouraged to only give partial praise. But putting that aside, what is the reason why you should not praise someone completely? You shouldn't effusively praise them to the full extent of their praise in front of them. So there are various reasons offered, humility, modesty, you don't want to appear like you're flattering them. But maybe it's this point. We don't want a person to know too much or to ruminate too much about their current accomplishments. Because that contains the risk of falling into a pattern of complacency of being satiated. We want it to stay hungry. We want it to feel a bit underappreciated. And thereby, perhaps he will be spurred to prove us wrong and maybe he will actualize more of his full potential. Had Pinchas gotten it for free, he wouldn't have had this chip on his shoulder. He wouldn't have that hunger. He wouldn't have something to prove. And he wouldn't have worked onto becoming this completely zealous lover of God. But because he was doubted, because he was not promoted, because he was overlooked, Pinchas made himself into the greatest heir of Aaron and the ultimate Kohen. And had he not had that fire in his pants, he would have cruised to being really righteous. But he would not have become Elijah, he would not have become an all-timer. The Talmud tells us in the book of Nidarim, page 81a, be very careful from the sons of the paupers. Havizar bibneim shalaniim. Be careful about the sons of the paupers. Shemihan teitze Torah. For Torah will emerge from them. Those that are underappreciated, unheralded, unsung, overlooked. No one really pays too much attention to them. Those are the ones that are motivated to give their absolute all and to develop into giants of Torah. Now, what do we do with this idea? How do we, how do we use it? I would be very wary of advising anyone to use this in a pedagogical setting. This is a very complex device. 
and only with extreme caution can it be used. It's not for everyone. Like I said earlier, for some, it can have a negative impact. Some people need so much encouragement, they need to be given even more encouragement than what they have truly earned. Other people, like Pinchas, some strategic disappointment can help them. I have a theory that we know that the Talmud tells us that the Almighty, He's the one who's the real matchmaker. He makes matches between husband and wife. My theory is that part of the Almighty's calculations when He apportions spouses to people is this point. The kind of spouse that you have, the kind of spouse that the Almighty assigns for you, is the kind of person that will best help you achieve your potential. And therefore, for some, you'll have a spouse that's very encouraging, always supportive, making sure that you don't get depressed. For others, you'll have a spouse that's just just not that impressed by by what you've done. Just not that impressed. You could do better. And you know what? You could. And the fact that you're not getting that encouragement and you're not, you're getting that disappointment and you feel like you've been overlooked. That's fuel. That's fuel for that fire in your belly. Stay hungry, my friends. Stay hungry, my friends, and go disprove them. There's something tremendously powerful about disappointment. And again, I would not encourage someone to use this device unless they know exactly what they're doing. But sometimes setting up little roadblocks, forcing someone to muster up all they have to prove themselves, when someone is overlooked, they become hungry and they have that chip on their shoulder and they have a grievance against the world, against society, against the lot that they've received in life. And under the correct circumstances, they will use that to marshal every ounce of energy they have to prove the world wrong. Now, I will say, even if we are wary about using this ourselves, we have to remember that the Almighty, He knows exactly what He's doing. And He's going to position us to best succeed. And when we say succeed, we mean to succeed in living up to the potential of what the Almighty gives you and what He expects of you. So sometimes, if you feel slighted, if you feel overlooked, if you are underappreciated, you should know it's quite possible that the Almighty is designing your environment. And he's trying to give you that strategic disappointment. He wants to put that chip on your shoulder. He wants to motivate you to maximize your potential. But when the time comes, the sea will part for you as it did for Penchas. When your moment to shine comes, absolutely nothing will get in the way. Rashi tells us something astonishing. Rashi tells us that in order to facilitate Pinchas' rise, Moshe forgot a law. His hands were weakened. He forgot a law. Now, if you look at the Ramban in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 2, he says that it's a miracle anytime Moshe forgets anything. So if we put these two pieces together, it's a miracle when Moshe forgets something and a miracle was needed to allow Moshe to forget something and thereby to facilitate Pinchas' rise. That reveals to us that when your moment has come, it's been 38 years of you building yourself up to prove the world wrong, to develop yourself into the person you can become, a miracle will happen to finally allow you to claim what is yours, what you have earned. If things don't seem to be fair, 
if there are disappointments that happened to you, don't let that get you down. Perhaps it could be that the Almighty is revving up your engine for much greater things. Okay, let's do this week's exquisite insight. Are you ready? Are you ready for another exquisite insight? Let's begin. Our Parsha continues the event of the end of last week's Parsha, and specifically the event that brought about Pinchas' ascent, his moment to shine. There were two people ahead of the tribe of Shimon, and he was in a very public fashion, behaving improperly, doing something absolutely abominable. And Pinchas came and did what he did to end the plague born about by Cosby and Zimri. Now, if you look at the way the Torah describes this story, it doesn't identify Zimri and Cosby until the very end of the story. In chapter 25, verse 14, it finally tells us that the Israelite man who was stricken was Zimri, the son of Salu, the head of the tribe of Shimon. Previously, he's just called an Israelite man. So if you look at the story, the way it's positioned from the beginning of chapter 25, starting, let's say, in verse 6, it tells us that there was a Hebrew man, an Israelite man. And he's called an Israelite man once in verse 6, twice more in verse 8, and then once again in verse 14. Four times in the story before the person is identified, he is called an Israelite man. Why are we calling this person an Israelite man and only later on revealing his identity, his true name? So there's an amazing Arachayim on chapter 25, verse 14. And he says something very fascinating. He says that if someone is part of this nation, no matter how far they have fallen, they are still an Israelite man. And even though the sparks, using Kabbalistic lingo, the sparks may have scattered, eventually they will be restored to their place. Even when an Israelite man does terrible things, nevertheless, their soul will eventually find its way back to its root. And that's what this person, who is behaving in an unconscionable fashion, he's called an Israelite man. And even after his deed, a deed that, again, unleashes a plague that destroys 24,000 of his brethren. Think about that. This is a traitor to his people. This is a person who's causing direct fatal harm to the nation. And nevertheless, what's he called? He's called an Israelite man. There's something about this person, notwithstanding all the terrible things that he has done, that's still connected to the nation. And then he adds that there was a part of his soul that got corrupted with this behavior. But after he was steward by Pinchas, that part was removed, was excised. And his death provided a purification and atonement. And therefore, it's appropriate to still label him an Israelite man because he is still part of the nation. I think this is an exquisite point for the following reasons. No matter how far someone may have fallen, no matter how much damage they may have brought about to their soul and by extension to the nation at large, they are still part of the nation and they can still be cleansed. There is something righteous and enduring that can be called Israel, like this great nation. No matter what a person does, no matter how far they may have strayed, that core that fire, that ember of Abraham within them 
cannot be stamped out. We are always redeemable. And we must never lose hope. It's never too late to repair, to restore. The Yetzirah wants us to think that we are beyond repair. Ah, just give up. What difference does it make? You've made so many mistakes already. You are beyond the pale. But it's not true. We're never too distant. Even someone like Zimri, who has directly contributed to the death of 24,000 Jews, he's still part of the nation. He has taken a huge hunk out of this nation. And absent the heroism of Pinchas, it would have been much more. But he is still part of the nation. And he can still be cleansed and be restored to God's good graces. The spark of Israel was still within him. He was still an Israelite man. I hope you enjoyed this edition of the Parsha Podcast. As much as I did, probably not, probably not. But it was wonderful to spend these minutes with you. I hope you're doing well. If you happen to be in Texas, send me an email. Tell me how sweltering it is there now. If you're in Canada, shoot me an email. Let's get together. Let's find some time. Regardless, thank you for listening. I hope you have an incredible week upcoming. And a sensational, terrific, uplifting, stupendous Shabbos upcoming. And please God, please God, with the help of the Almighty, once again, next week, it'll be a double Parsha. The only double Parsha of this current cycle of the year. And please God, we got together again to discuss the words of Torah on the Parsha podcast. My name is Yaakov Wolby. Our organization is called Torch. Check us out, torchweb.org. Send me an email, rabbiwalby at gmail.com.